Friends and subscribers, this is China News for September 2015. Here in China, it uh, becomes more and more obvious that the emperor is in his underwear. This is referring to Xi Jinping, obviously, who is now in the United States talking about trade, talking about cybersecurity, and other issues of high interest. Now, with the emperor exposed in his underwear, it's only a matter of time before people understand that the emperor wears no clothes. China is in deep trouble, losing 40% of its stock market value in just 2015 alone. What's different about this collapse in China compared to other mini bubbles popping along the way? Well, uh, in comparison, this collapse in China is a, really a tipping point because um, everything is twice as big today as it was back then. The banking system, the economy, the debt, the dependence, of course, on exports if you're a Chinese firm. And that wasn't necessarily the case entirely in 2010-2011 post-U.S. mortgage crisis collapse. Now, there are several other things to understand here about Xi Jinping that many people do not. That uh, under Hu Jintao in Jiang Ximin, there was a different leadership faction in China. Uh, you can really see the Shy Coms as two different main factions uh, when you look at leadership in China, where Hu Jintao and Jiang Ximin, Bo Qi Lai, the Chongqing strongman who is now jailed, uh, were part really of more of that uh, reformist mold uh, that wanted China to look outward, to do business with uh, international firms to modernize China, to break it out of the dogma that had been really crippling China for so many decades in the past. Whereas um, Xi is really more of your old school type of strong military, strong rhetoric, Maoist principles, and things of that nature. So his speech, his outlook on how China treats the rest of the world is a little more hard line. You know, he's PLA, People's Liberation Army, all the way. Um, less really about big business and international relationships than making China strong internally. And uh, of course, that starts with the military. So Xi Jinping, more of a military man. Uh, the previous leaders, more of businessmen, more of the type that would be connected to the Chinese mafia in Shanghai, in uh, Hong Kong area, and so on, okay? That's, that's the, I guess, uh, ideologies when you look at those. Those are the main differences. There are many other subtle differences, obviously, uh, when, you, when you talk in depth about Chinese leadership. Uh, in Beijing. But uh, that's it in a nutshell. And so with more and more people seeing that she is in his underwear and the emperor is, is really naked, uh, she is focusing more on uh, hardline international issues and pushing things in South China Sea. More on that in a moment. Very important news article to understand is this one. Fanya Exchange, 36 billion yuan default tip of iceberg in China. Like I've been saying for many, many months, the beginning of the crash in China that we're seeing over the past couple months is just the tip of the iceberg because we have all of these rogue exchanges that are insolvent. Okay, this Fanya Exchange, rhodium and steel to garlic and onion, you name it, they trade it. Hundreds of these so-called commodity exchanges across China have mushroomed and gone far beyond their limitations to cover their exchange transactions. One trillion yuan in investments for this one. Beijing now investigating it. There are 400 at least sus exchange platforms in China managing roughly more than one trillion yuan of assets. So these people here protesting uh, the fact that uh, investors are not going to be made whole on these exchanges which are 
virtually bankrupt and uh, they're worried about uh, getting their money's worth back. Um, their t-shirts being sold by angry investors calling Fanya a scam in Chinese, okay? Central government is investigating it again. 36 billion yuan default. Again, this is only one of the many exchanges. Here's uh, a little graphic here that tells you a little bit about what they're doing. Notice the rare metals producers involved, rare metals traders, okay, connected to retail investors. This is a huge problem, and it could have global implications. Um, I'll be getting more of this information out to you as it progresses and we find out exactly what is going on with these exchanges and how the government will make investors whole. Perhaps they'll issue a bailout. Perhaps they won't. More to come on this. China continues its South China Sea reclamation project despite halt claim, experts say. This satellite photo here was taken earlier this month on the 8th, and it shows that, once again, China has picked up its dredging and building of islands and other types of sea-bearing Chinese projects in the South China Sea in international waters. Now, the dispute here coming from other countries is that international waters are international waters and they shouldn't be claimed by any one country. Rather, they are kind of the sea's highway of being able to transport goods in and out of various countries throughout Asia. And of course, having a neutral fishing ground too is a part of the reason why they have been deemed international waters for so many years now. Yet China claims now that these waters are theirs. Now, this reclamation project is picked up after uh, several weeks of no activity. And we can see not only from the satellite photos, but we can also see from uh, Chinese news reports and uh, news reports from Vietnam and Thailand and Philippines, etc., that um, these uh, projects are producing what appears to be military uh, quality installations. 3,000 meter strip would be able to accommodate most Chinese military aircraft. This leads us all to believe that uh, these type of projects are not in a peaceful nature, okay? When you're building 3,000 meter airstrips to accommodate large planes, you can determine that these can only be used for military purposes. Why else would you build an airstrip that would accommodate a, a, a ship that was not needed in that region for humanitarian efforts or fishing or any other type of so-called peaceful activities? Um, now, the uh, Chinese foreign minister uh, has maintained that China has indisputable sovereignty over the Spratly Islands and has a right to establish military facilities there. Now, if this is not a act of war, I don't know what is, because when you're talking about having indisputable sovereignty and the right to establish military facilities in international water, that is powder in the keg. That is a shot across the bow. And it appears that at least initially the United States and Western powers aren't going to do much of anything about it. Now, why really is China continuing the South China Sea reclamation projects at such a pace that they are? They have uh, a lot more to do really with China's domestic situation and what you may believe. Now we know that Xi Jinping is at, at trouble at home, not only with the uh, different factions within the uh, Shai Koms, but also from the general public that are seeing their uh, way of life changed as far as uh, economically. And uh, these problems are deeper than what anybody knows. And as they continue to worsen, uh, Xi Jinping's got to find some distraction. He's got to find something to do with international concerns that will take some of the pressure off his domestic issues that are troubling. And one way that you do that is by having these reclamation projects and building things outside of your borders and concerning yourself in international affairs and 
publishing rhetoric that uh, will get the Chinese public focused on other things uh, outside of their troubling economy. Much more on this to come in the uh, near future. Gold mooncakes for sale. Every season, every year in China, there are special commemorative coins and special bullion or ingot style gold and silver pieces that you can buy over the counter. I've shown you many of them on this channel. Here is a photo of the latest moon cake style gold ingot that you can buy over the counter here in China. And they are lovely indeed. Um, each year a different design, uh, low mintage usually, and may or may not be a rarity that you want to invest in. I'll tell you why. Because you don't know for sure, as a coin collector and a silver and gold investor, if a particular piece is going to become something more than what it appears to be. In other words, you don't know if a rarity is going to be a significant rarity as opposed to just an obscure rarity that doesn't get any respect out on the market when you have uh, buyers and sellers. Very tricky indeed to figure it out, and um, most experts even have trouble understanding which types of commemorative coins will be worth a significant amount of money. Now, if you want to do something, uh, a little bit of research on the side here, do a search for Chinese gold pagodas. Those were commemorative coins that were released years ago, and they were rather obscure commemorative coins, nothing special in particular. Like I said, every season and every year, China produces a lot of commemorative coins and ingots in low mintages, so you never really know uh, if it's going to be of any value. The premiums are quite high. Not exactly something that you can easily go out and get with confidence, but there are instances where a rarity in a great condition will become worth even more depending on the mintages and depending on air coins etc it's really fascinating it's what makes coin collecting uh, interesting so um, do your research and if you find something that is nice something that is rare and something that is significant pick it up otherwise avoid this Driven to Kill, this troubling news story has to do with Chinese culture and it's a little bit difficult to explain but I'm going to do my best to tell you what it all means. Uh, why drivers in China intentionally kill the pedestrians they hit? It's quite complicated and unfortunately it's difficult to erase this cultural phenomenon from the consciousness of the general public here in mainland China. Um, it has to do a lot with the compensation paid to pedestrians that are either injured or killed by drivers. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave this link here so that you can read the article yourself. It's posted by a journalist who um, was actually discussing this with uh, a Chinese driver while traveling in China. And unfortunately, in China still, the laws uh, state that if someone is injured by a driver. Amounts uh, for killing a victim are much lower than an injury. Killing a victim in traffic accidents is relatively small. Amounts typically range from $30,000 US equivalent to $50,000 US equivalent. And once payment is made, the matter is over as far as the courts are concerned. However, if you hit and injure a driver, and their medical bills mount over the years and they have any permanent damage, you could easily pay $400,000 equivalent over those years of care depending on the severity of the injury. So you can imagine how difficult this is for uh, the average Chinese who can't afford to pay out anything, yet uh, when they do hit a pedestrian, sometimes they will back up the car and go backwards over it until they are dead, making sure they're dead so that they'll pay less. And in both cases, not going to jail because this is accidental. This is for accidental driving accidents that are either no fault of both parties or the fault of the pedestrian that is hit. OK, this is not uh, any malicious intent, which um, is difficult to prove in China uh, because of the way the court system is and the way that uh, 
people quite frankly are when it comes to honesty and integrity. Uh, no one tells the truth and you can be sure that they won't be swearing on a Bible when they take the stand. So difficult to understand, but it's this way really throughout Asia. Uh, most of the third world is this way as well. When you have these quirky laws, you could find yourself being hit by a Chinese driver and having them come back to finish the job and kill you. Strange but true. This new story is a source of some kind of angst for myself because I work in the tech industry, but China asked some U.S. tech firms to pledge commitment to its policies, a New York Times report coming out and saying that. Now, as we know, uh, right now, this week, Xi Jinping is in the United States and talking about tech, talking about hackers and talking about trade policies and things of that nature in the light of what's happening uh, as far as cyber warfare is concerned. It's really uh, quite laughable to me that uh, this kind of rhetoric can be coming out of China uh, at this time. Now, on the one hand, China uh, does allow U.S. tech firms to operate within Chinese borders, but as we've seen through the years, especially in the case of Google, they have restrictions and they have limitations on what you can and can't do while you're operating within the borders of mainland China. And this is kind of a thin line because uh, not only do you have to give over some of your intellectual property, but you also have to hire a certain number of Chinese employees. You have to pay uh, taxes as to whatever they say to the Chinese government. And um, you have to be somewhat transparent. And they're really strict about this, uh, which is a laugh because uh, we know that most Chinese companies, even government-run institutions, are using fake software by Microsoft and other companies. I know because I've worked in some of these companies, done some consulting work in factories and other types of uh, Chinese related businesses throughout the country here. And uh, most, if not all of them have illegal software installed on their computer networks. So it's very hypocritical for Xi Jinping to be commenting on uh, adhering to Chinese policies when Chinese policies when it comes to tech is to steal intellectual property and use illegal software. One of the cartoons of the month has to do with the elderly. As you know, China has a aging population as does most of Asia and of course the United States also has an aging population with baby boomers now retiring in record numbers and when we talk about this, we talk about uh, pensions and health care and what's happening in China with pensions and health care. Well, life certificate. Uh, a 70-year-old uh, woman is complaining about the hoops she's got to jump through to get her pension. Okay, In China, to eliminate fraud, what happens is a lot of elderly have to go through checkups and administrative procedures before they can get their pension doled out every month, quarter, whatever. What they have to do is they have to bring in a relative and they have to basically have a picture taken with the relative and have a newspaper for that day held up so that they can stamp it and they can prove that in fact this person showed up on this date with their relative and they are who they say they are. Now this is a little bit uh, indignified for the elderly as uh, they want to be able to get their pension without going through these hoops and without being treated in a manner uh, such as this, holding up newspapers and having their photo taken and basically have being fingerprinted and uh, bio-detected so that they can get the pension that they've, they've earned up over the years. Same thing that's happening in Europe and the United States. Now, for those of you that have paid into Medicare, Medicaid throughout your life, uh, those of you that are newly retiring and going to get uh, benefits or think you're going to get benefits, well, I've got news for you. Uh, nothing is free. And what you've paid for, you didn't get because you're not going to get it. In other words, you can get Medicare after you've paid into it your whole life, but what you're getting is not health care. What you're getting is not free because it only covers basic checkups. It only covers a very limited number of medical-related 
uh, issues, including drugs, that you may need throughout your elderly years. So you've paid in throughout your whole life and you're getting very little back. You've got to supplement that health care that you've earned up and pay extra to get emergency care, to get the meds you need fully paid for, and so on and so on. So the scam with Obamacare, of course, uh, being part of this, we have death panels now in the United States. Uh, you've got uh, certain types of death panels throughout Asia and China that are similar in nature. Um, basically getting you to pay in throughout your whole lifetime to get medical care and yet still having to pay in your retirement years and going through hoops to get what you've earned. Any of you out there who think that Obamacare is a positive thing should have your head examined, okay? Uh, you're a complete fool. And this is the concern of elderly throughout the world, not just in China. The last cartoon of the month shows a population shift. We see Uncle Sam's hat there as America rapidly prepares for Asians becoming the number one ethnicity type to be immigrating into the United States, overtaking all others. The balance is shifting. We take a look at the numbers here. Asians are poised to become the biggest immigrant group in the United States. And uh, we see that uh, this includes, of course, uh, India as well as China. By 2055, uh, Asians are expected to become the largest immigrant group in the United States and will constitute nearly 40% of foreign-born population by 2065. This is of no surprise as we look at United States immigration policies and how ineffective they are and how skewed they are as Asians are able to come into the United States um, much easier than other ethnicities and in many cases like I've reported here over the months uh, Chinese uh, immigrants are coming to the United States to have their babies anchor babies as we refer to them many hospitals in the United States actually catering to Chinese customers that will pay extra to come and have their baby born and get instant citizenship now, what is wrong with this process? Well, again, this goes back for, to tit for tat. You can't do this in China. If you're an American-born couple and you go to China to have your anchor baby in China, what will they do? They will deport you. And that is the case in many countries around the world. But the United States being the chump in this situation as they're opening uh, their arms and allowing immigrants to come in and uh, get instant citizenship and in some cases getting services and getting benefits that even uh, natural born Americans don't have. Race or ethnicity of recent immigrant arrivals, there's the numbers that are skewing. And uh, when we see the demographic shift like this, we can then predict what's going to happen in terms of how the U.S. market is going to look domestically. What's Main Street in USA going to look like? Well, it's already transforming now. And we can see trends and predict trends this way by understanding that U.S. domestically is going to shift even more towards Asian tastes when it comes to dining, when it comes to housing, when it comes to clothing, music, and other types of consumer goods. That's just a tip of the iceberg. Now, when GOP frontwater Donald Trump comments about Mexican immigrants and talks about putting up a wall to prevent uh, Mexican immigrants from illegally entering into the United States, what he should be talking about is Asians, because that is the trend, especially with Chinese coming in dishonestly and setting up a shop and having uh, children here anchor babies as they're termed this is simply deceitful and it is wrong and um, of course the united states is doing very little about it and hopefully that will change because as i've said before it's got to be tit for tat if the united states is going to allow anchor babies and going to give benefits to asians that uh, have not paid any taxes the same should be done for u.s citizens abroad although it is not fair so 
Um, if you were to call me a racist or call anyone a racist that is complaining about this, they should understand that it's not anything to do about ethnicity. It is not anything to do about race. It has to do with policies. It has to do with an even playing field for immigration, for trade, for other types of international geopolitical issues. If it's not even, then we should complain about it. And if we don't stand up and complain about it today, we'll complain about it eventually anyway. So a big area of concern, not just in the United States, but in other countries as well, as they're seeing influxes of foreigners coming to uh, take jobs and benefits that uh, they haven't properly earned. you got to play by the rules, and then everyone can benefit. Ever wonder what the minimum wage is in China? Well, Beijing tops China's hourly minimum wage. Beijing set a minimum wage standard at 18.70 yuan or 2.9 US dollars per hour from September onward. So that is the highest minimum wage uh, in China and uh, it uh, will buy you, well, not much, not much. But uh, when you consider this minimum wage increase and you, you know the talk in the United States is about a $15 minimum wage across the board, you can kind of compare uh, what the lower class is going to be making and the standard of living across the board for the two countries. So the wage disparity is huge. It's huge uh, between the rich, the growing middle class, and the lower class in China. Uh, Shenzhen set the highest minimum monthly wage at 2,030 yuan and the lowest minimum wage throughout China in the far west territories is 1,160 yuan per month. Now you know why uh, Chinese are considered to be house slaves because with wages like this, how could they ever hope to pay for their overpriced high-rise homes? In talking about China's economy, we have to also take a look at contrarian views. Uh, there are some out there that still really believe um, that China is okay, that uh, this is just a blip on the radar, this is just a stumble, and China will recover quickly and continue to grow at double-digit GDP year-on-year. Uh, year. Well, let's take a look at some of these contrarian views. Uh, UBS, the uh, Swiss banking uh, conglomerate, says, relax, China has more than enough reserves. Uh, let's take a close look at the chart here and see uh, evolution of China's official Forex reserves. And we see that, indeed, uh, Forex reserves have climbed substantially uh, since uh, 2000, uh, year on year, almost uh, completely growing each year. Uh, yet we have to consider that with these Forex reserves uh, where they're at, that, in, in fact, uh, China's total $3.5 trillion reserves are held in developed countries' government bonds. Uh, roughly $1.4 trillion are U.S. Treasuries. And they're arguably the most liquid assets of, of the bunch that they hold. But they hold a lot of uh, Forex uh, that are from developing countries. And so they're more difficult to liquidate. They're more difficult to really put a value on because... Um, uh, you know, inflation rages in some of these countries and, and uh, their paper can't be totally trusted. I mean, heck, we can't even trust uh, U.S. paper anymore at the rate that they're printing money. Um, you know, the Fed is not exactly trustworthy across the board. So, yes, although the contrarian view says that China is OK with all of these reserves, they're holding these debt notes in the currencies that are mostly all going down. So although the Forex reserves are climbing, the value of those reserves are going down year on year as well. So adjusted for inflation, um, real inflation of these currencies and other assets, we can see that the only true asset that China has that is going to be uh, a appreciating one and one that's going to have significant weight 
going forward is their gold reserves, not their forex reserves, not their foreign paper that can be defaulted on, that can be devalued, that is going to be difficult for them to liquidate over time. And that is my view on it, that uh, don't look at the number, look at the value of what it is they're holding. Further contrarian views uh, claim that the sky is not falling on China's economy, even when it is, you know, um, cry wolf here, right? Stock market's falling, the economy has question marks all over it, yet you have uh, these Chinese think tanks saying that it is not. So, um, you know, it just it gets more comical. Uh, every article that I read uh, on these contrarian views. But the point that um, the university in Hong Kong is making is that uh, China will not suffer a hard landing simply because they're going to shift to a consumer, a consumption-based model where they don't have to devalue the renminbi more than they have and that uh, they can concentrate more on being a consumption-based economy and internationalizing the renminbi abroad. But what they're not considering here in this very short article, um, and not terribly well written, is the fact that uh, this will take years. This will take many years to come. And China has a lot of people. The population is very huge. And although it is true, China, um, their consumption for households is growing 50% faster than real GDP. And that is important to remember that they are major consumers that um, in the event that uh, the renminbi does become internationally stronger than what it is and be becomes a currency that can compete internationally with the U.S. dollar, those renminbi units by Chinese households will become more important and have more purchasing power and therefore be able to speak. So currencies can speak for themselves and they can um, carry more weight than what they appear to have on the forex market and that again is based on the conditions um, you know domestically and internationally so it's easier said than done like I said before they haven't even been approved in the IMF in the basket of currencies for the SDR um, so just to get that would be one step in getting the renminbi more internationally known and if they can't even get that far um, this rhetoric that the sky is not falling in china is completely false it's an uphill battle um, i don't envy their position at all because this is going to take years to transition to and they're going to have to punch the dollar in the mouth if they're going to take over that spot because um, the west does not play fair ball